guide and Holly came on our trip and I did a talk and um, Holly really yeah. liked it obviously <laughs> and, uh, and this if you would have gone on my tour back then this is what you would have heard oh, <laughs> it's fine it's for fun and there's one there's one part that's kind of there's one part that's kind of obviously not like gonna be okay up to date now but uh, so just allow for artistic license and, and just go with it you know so the people get on the bus you know and they're all sitting there and then we start driving away and I'd say Haynes is notable for not having much no Pizza Hut no McDonald's no Starbucks no Subway no mall no movie theater it's a great place to live if you don't like the work because there's no jobs here oh I tend to exaggerate if you can manage a liquor store you can get hired quick but that's basically the wrap on Haynes. There's no economy, and there's a few theories as to why, and usually they invoke the environmentalists. It seems the environmentalists live off trust funds and have time to write letters and write a pretty good letter because they've got everything locked up and nothing happens. They say we are divided, and that keeps us from moving forward, but every time I hear that, I think they're really saying we'd be a lot less divided if you would just agree with everything I say. But I've studied Haynes, and I've studied this economy stuff, actually, and and you know it's not the environmentalists that messed up the economy it's the winter, it was the winter. <laughs> and you know it was god that messed up the haynes economy and we should be mad at the church people <laughs> but the essence of haynes is it's limited stores and traffic it's different than a lot of places if you are five minutes late for a meeting in haynes you're considered early the clocks in all the stores are set at different times some of them would be closer to actual times if they used an hourglass. And no one ever wears a suit in Haynes. I wore a suit one time just to freak people out. And it worked. Everyone ran for me because they thought I was a lawyer from Juno going to hand over a subpoena. One of my favorite stories about Haynes was one time someone left an older but not too bad Toyota truck in a pullout at 18 Mile. That's 18 miles up the highway from Haynes. So this truck just sat there in full view of anyone driving by from the end of one summer, through the fall, through the winter, through the spring, and into the next summer. In most places, a truck like that would get parted out, but this one just sat there untouched. Finally, a local, um, Dennis Miles, who was tired of seeing it on his drive to work every day, towed it over right next to the side of the highway, thinking that the Department of Transportation would then have to deal with it because it was in the right-of-way. Well, the trooper and the wildlife enforcement officer drove up to it and said they didn't have the money in their budgets to tow it or have it towed, so they pushed it over behind some bushes and hit it. <laughs> then someone put a free sign on it and it was gone there soon thereafter. <laughs> I got another police story for you from Haynes. One time there was someone siphoning gas out of people's cars out in the Mud Bay area, a rural area south of town where a lot of folks have cabins up in the woods so their cars sit down on the highway unwatched. Well, this started in the winter and went on for a while, and that's kind of unusual for around here because we don't have a lot of crime and stuff. And, and then I saw one of the residents from that area in the coffee shop in the spring, and I said, hey, are they still siphoning gas out of your cars? And he said, yep. I said, well, is there any patterns? Because I have a real keen mind for figuring out criminal stuff because I watch Law and Order a lot, you know? And he said, yeah, yeah, he, he goes on Monday nights. And I said, oh, that's good, good info. Did you tell the trooper? And he said, yeah, I told the trooper. And I said, what did he say? And he said, the trooper said, that's my day off. <laughs> we, we actually need police officers now. We had one guy arrest a lot of people, and he got run out of town. <laughs> yeah, we used to have an officer that sat right on Main Street and watched people leave the bar, get in their car, and drive away, and he arrested them for DWI. So the city council passed a law that he couldn't do that. <laughs> I guess the reasoning was it was too easy, you know, like snagging fish or <laughs> headlighting deer from the road, you know. <laughs> you got to give them a sporting chance, you know. <laughs> anyway, since the main topic is usually sex, I mean economy, let's get back to that. It's said that, you know, we have no economy here, and like I said, it's because of the winter. That's right, the Alaska winter is long, cold, and dark. Living in Haines in the winter is like living on Pluto. They don't mention that in our ads. So if, you're, if you're a single guy, it's especially brutal because there's only one available girl in town, and if she isn't your type, it's scientifically impossible to get a date here. Now, this being the modern age and all that, um, there is some 
help. There's a remedy, but it's a secret. But you guys are cool, so I'm going to tell you. The internet. You better. <laughs> That's right. There's girls and guys on the internet. You just type in a little about yourself, for instance, a couch potato with a slight substance abuse issue, likes a snowmobile, seeks petite Asian with low standards. <laughs> and they put you in the computer, and a slip of paper comes out, and there's your dream girl's name. And it, it, you'd laugh, but it happened for my one buddy out the road there. He, he went to his wedding, and he said right at the altar in front of God, the preacher, and everyone, I want to thank Match.com. It was the best $39 I ever spent. <laughs> my other buddy, Paul, said Match.com was like the Kmart of dating sites. He'd only go to a high-class specialty store at the mall, like eHarmony. $99, and you do a four-hour test on yourself. Well, he signed up, and sure enough, he got a girl from L.A.'s number, and boy, did they hit it off. He said, she's the one, Joe, with this dazed look in his eyes. He showed me her picture, and she was a knockout. She had done some modeling. She was in her bikini with the palm tree in the background. And I said, man, you got to go see her. He said, no, no, we're taking it slow. And they talked on the phone all the time. Every time I went to his house for months, he was talking to her. Months, I tell you. He, he said they talked four to five hours a day. And I said, my goodness, what do you talk about? He said, oh, it's all spontaneous. <laughs> She's the one, Joe. Well, finally, after months of this, he sets up his meeting in Las Vegas to meet her, to meet his dream girl. And he was excited. And all of his friends were excited, too. He, was he going to marry her and bring her home? Because there aren't that many people up the road. And, you know, we'd like to see a fresh face and stuff like that. So, well, Paul came back from Vegas and no girl. And we asked, what happened? He said, some people on the internet use pictures that are old. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I did eHarmony and they said I was unmatchable. <laughs> Actually, I have a girlfriend, believe it or not. We met the old fashioned way. We were drinking. <laughs> and it turns along we turns out we got along real good as long as we aren't drinking at the same time. <laughs> then it's like two survivalists in a bomb shelter. <laughs> but we've been going out for a while and she's fixing me. I'm a lot more materialistic now. <laughs> and she's got two kids. I never had any, but these modern relationships, you can pick up a family in about a time it takes to get a burrito at the drive-thru. <laughs> one is 10, and she's the sweetest kid on earth, and one is 16, and she's kind of the opposite. But it's been very educational for me getting to see the teenage mind up close, <coughs> being the pseudo-dad. It seems to be the teenage mind, that is. Give me food, give me shelter, give me some clothes, give me some money and a car, but don't tell me what to do because I'm my own person. And the mindset, you know, it's, it's just maddening, you know. Everything that comes up, it's always, how can I do something by not really doing it? And make people think I did it even though I didn't, thereby proving how smart I am by doing something by not doing something. We saw a good example of that in Sarah Palin. But the most sobering aspect of this scenario is really realizing that I was like that when I was a teenager. In fact, I called my parents when I was 35 and profusely apologized for all the stuff I did or didn't do. They said, that's nice, Joe, but you owe us for that car you wrapped around a tree. I said, what? That wasn't my fault. It was foggy. And the road was wet. And a deer jumped out in front of me. Oh, wait, there was a whole herd of deer. And they, they pushed me off the road. And it wasn't my fault. And then we get to the Chilkoot River. And then the people would be fishing out there. And I'd say, the people fishing are Canadians. Canadians get up to about 270 pounds and live approximately 70 years. They have on average 2.3 offspring in their lifespan. Canadians mate for life, uh, usually. Uh, Canadians' diet consists mainly of fish and beer. So if you have beer, keep it in the cooler. If a Canadian smells it, they might get aggressive. And then every once in a while there'd be a Canadian on there going, You can't say that! You can't say that! And then the other people would laugh even more. So. The end.